Well, welcome to the Business Spotlight Series. My name is Tanner O'Brien. I'm a senior partner here at Action Coach in Central Texas. Today, I'm sitting down with my guest, Henrik Johansson, who is the co-founder and CEO of Gemba. So excited to be jumping in, having some conversation about business, about this journey of entrepreneurship that many of us are on, and uh, just kind of have some fun here today. So Henrik, first and foremost, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, excited to jump into it. Let's start with maybe just a little bit of background. You know, give us the, I'll call it the 10,000 foot view of who you are and tell us a little bit about the business. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Um, yeah, I've been doing entrepreneurial stuff for 30 years or so. <laughs> I grew up in Sweden uh, in a family that was not entrepreneurial at all. Um, and I went to school in Sweden and got my first job there uh, working in management consulting. And it was through that I had an opportunity to come to to the U.S., uh, moved to Dallas, met my wife to be there. We moved to San Francisco and uh, happened to be there during the dot-com days, you know, the late 90s. And that's when I realized that, you know, being a consultant had, had its advantages, but, you know, I was on the road 100% of the time. And I had my young, pretty girlfriend in San Francisco and I wasn't there. So I was like, yeah, that's, that's not working out for me. And then, you know, the the exciting time to be in San Francisco it was like the epicenter of the internet boom right uh, so uh, that that's that sounded interesting to me so I ended up found a couple of co-founders and we started started my first business in in 98 uh during the dot-com days and I've been doing that ever since now different startups very cool well, I'm excited to kind of you know learn some of the lessons that I'm sure you gained along the way uh, but tell us a little bit about the the current business tell us about Gemba Yes. Uh, Gemba is the, the world's first uh, marketplace for consumer product innovation. So I'm sure you're aware that, you know, plays, players like Shopify and Amazon have made it super easy to start a new e-commerce business, right? It, it takes almost no money, very little effort. Uh, but what we see is that the vast majority of the folks that start a business, they don't necessarily have the expertise to create and develop new products, right? It's pretty easy to set up a business and you know, to to do some drop shipping or find some product on Alibaba and, and resell it. But considering how mature and, and saturated those marketplaces are now, you're not going to be successful long term unless you create your own unique differentiated products. And that doesn't exist. So that was the big void we saw in the market, right? There's all these people that start a commerce business, want to be successful. But they have often have very little product development expertise. You know, they don't have a design expertise. They don't have very little supply chain expertise. And as a result, when they try to develop new products, often they fail. I mean, it's difficult. And only if one little thing goes wrong in that product development journey, that could mean uh, that that business is over, right? They don't have the funds uh, to, to start over a project or they, they can't survive if they get a container full of products that don't work the way they're supposed to, right? So we, we saw that big need and a growing need as, as e-commerce is becoming bigger and bigger and, and created a solution to, to help that. Very cool. I love that. And how long ago did you all launch the business? Yeah, it's been about four years now. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been a, an interesting journey, I'll say that, you know, because we started, it was during the, or right before the pandemic. And then, as you can imagine, during the pandemic, e-commerce was blowing up. So we suddenly found ourselves like these really strong tailwinds. It's like we were growing 5x in 2019, 3x in 2021. And we felt like we, you know, we're going to conquer the world. And then 2022 happened and it was completely different. Like it, it went from what we felt we have perfect product market fit to wondering where the market went, right? So it was a, it's a humbling experience. Uh, but, you know, I think we're out on the other side now. We had to innovate a lot. We had to really challenge every assumption we had about the business. We had to figure out how to use technology in creative ways to lower our price point and how to do it with much le less people. Uh, so, you know, it was, it, was, it was tough 18, 24 months. And now, now it feels like things are finally turning around. And I think we found that product market fit again. Uh, so we're, we're returning to, to strong growth here in 2024. 
That's amazing. Uh, so I always like to, as part of just kind of setting the stage and getting some of the background. So you uh, mentioned on the on the top here that your co-founder and your CEO. Um, what is what does the CEO role look like to you in your business today? Because I know that can be very different from a you know just starting the company and what that could look like to you know growth over the last four years. I'm sure things have. Uh, adapted and grown and changed along that way. So what what is the what does the role look like for you in the business today? Yeah, uh, great question. I, mean, I think it, it, in any startup, and if we're 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 a venture funded uh, technology startup, right? So uh, there's there's a little bit difference, I think, there because you, it's, it, it's you're you're committed to growth by taking other people's money. You know that you're you're on rapid growth is expected right uh which is a little different if you if you if you bootstrap you're running your own company starting it you know as long as you're profitable you don't necessarily have to grow uh you can run a great business for for many years and make a great living and build great value over time but you know if you're vc funded you grow or die basically it's, it's an expectation that you gotta you gotta you're shooting for the moon and you gotta go fast so I'd say in in that type of company, um, and that's really the only one I've experienced. And uh, key is is of course growth. You have to find growth. I don't think you can delegate growth. I think uh, product is super important that you can't really delegate completely. Either. Of course, you need teams to work on it, but you live and die by your by your product. And when I say product, the platform, the software that you develop, and then finally, I think team. You can't do anything without without a great team. You're never going to be able to scale on, unless you hire people that are smarter than yourself, that are better than you at in their in their discipline, and then you know allowing those people to grow and take ownership and and be the best version of themselves. Uh, so I'd say those are those are the top three. I love that. And when you look at kind of your uh, say the enjoyment areas, you know you can look at the different parts of business from marketing to sales to kind of the operational and, and product development side to building team and finance for some of those that enjoy the numbers like I do. Um, where do you find yourself enjoying or which pieces of the business do you find yourself enjoying the most? Yeah, I did, I did a personality test one time and it surprised me a little bit. I mean, it probably shouldn't, but I, I really thrive in the creative aspects of the business. Um, I probably should have become an artist or something instead, but uh, <laughs> but the, the part where I really love doing and it, it doesn't feel like work right is is the strategic stuff the whiteboard sessions when you brainstorm about how to solve some difficult problem in in new and novel ways uh, i certainly love the, the the team aspects too of finding and, and working with with great people uh, i'd say out of those three maybe growth is the one that's that's least enjoyable it doesn't mean it's 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 exciting, right? When you drive drive goals, but that's more of the sales and marketing side of finding people. And uh, but yeah, that, I'd say that the creative aspects uh, and when you work with the team to to change the world, right? To figure out how you can do things better, faster, smarter for your customers. Mm, I love that. So I, w- I want to you know pull back for a second. So you had mentioned being a part of you know a number of different startups over the last you know couple decades. Um, if I'm recalling correctly, you'd mentioned most or all of them had been kind of VC backed and uh, had yeah. co-founders in, in in all of them, or was there any that you did kind of completely on your own? No, it's it's always been co-founders uh, teams of. Well, the first one was actually four co-founders, which may be one too many. <laughs> the second one was two, which I think maybe one too late. This last one was three, which I think is uh, maybe the perfect amount. And I, and I think that there's some fair amount of research out there that supports that, that uh, in general, if you want to go far, it's better to go together with other people uh, and have really founders that are complementary, that have, you know, different skill sets and bring different things to the table. So it's not just like three copies of, <laughs> of yourself. Um, and that, I think we had that, uh, we have that here at Gamba. That's that, that was actually gonna be my next question is like, how do you, how do you look for or choose kind of the right business partners to go into business with? Um, having been through it a number of times, you know, for 
uh, for other entrepreneurs out there that may be looking at um, whether it be founding a new company and, and selecting some some business partners or it's you know maybe merging some entities together and bringing on business partners uh, what advice would you give them or kind of what based on your experience how would you help somebody choose and what to look for or what to avoid in potential business partners well to i think yeah the, you have to get along really well and and have an, an amazing amount of trust in each other and and belief because you're going to spend more time with your business partners than you do with your wife or your kids or you know your friends uh so i think that's that's super important um i'd say from a business perspective like i like i said earlier to find people with complementary skills right so you're not all like we all love accounting so we all got to be in in the spreadsheets but <laughs> as uh, I think it's great if you know I'm more of an introvert even though I've worked over the years to to kind of I'm, I can fake not being an introvert pretty well but at the, at the core that's sort of uh, I'm I'm more introvert than, than let's say my co-founder Stephen who's is an extrovert he's more of an evangelist you know if you will someone that sort of continuously and and naturally just preaches the gospel of the company so I think that those are two important roles to have uh and then you know a technical co-founder particularly if you're in in the space that we are uh you got to have somebody that just like is naturally an, a brilliant engineer that always you know figures out how to solve things through technology uh so i'd say that yeah i mean ethical did you get along real well and uh and then complementary skills those are fantastic points um, so let's talk a little bit more about the business itself. Uh, I want to, I always like to ask the question of like, who primarily does your business serve? And kind of the way I like to frame this up for the audience is if I'm on the other end of this and I'm listening to it, I'm watching it later on, how would I know that I'm a really good fit? Or I might know somebody who'd be a really good fit to, to give you all a call and, and learn more about the platform. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, so we, what we identified was that there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of people, they have a need to create new products but they don't really know how to go about it. You know, they, our typical customer is somebody who has already had some success. You know, they're probably a million dollars in revenues or more, but now they're looking to take it to the next level. So somehow they figured out that first product, that first iteration of getting that to market. And now they're looking at, okay, I have to start a pet brand or a baby pro brand or, or you know, maybe a home and kitchen brand, whatever it is. And now you, you've probably spent a couple of years getting through that journey, getting that first product to market, and it was hard <laughs> and you worked a long time to get there. And now you're looking at, all right, I, I need to launch product two, three, and four, you know, in order to build a successful brand, you have to be able to sell more products to your same customers. And you realize that you could probably use some help in doing that. And because you have to run the business, right? You can't just like the first time around, the CEO, the founder can focus all their energy on getting that first product to market. But now you have that in market, then now you have to develop new products and still run the business. So I think that's a perfect customer for us. So somebody who's been through it, have done it once, understands the complexities of it and understand the value in bringing in someone to do that. Um, and then the way Gemba is set up is on one hand, we're a technology company. We, we have a proprietary software platform that knows how to make pretty much anything. So you say, I want to create a set of headphones with solar cells on top. So they charge themselves. Our platform will spit out. Here's your 87 point project plan, all the things you need to do to bring that product to market. But then it also identifies what resources do you need? So in that scenario, you're going to need an industrial designer, but not just any designer. You want somebody that worked at Bose or Skullcandy or somebody who's made headphones before, right? And that's what we have. We have over 600 designer and engineers in our network. So based on the product that comes in, we'll assign the very best person that we can find anywhere in the world to work on that project. And then similarly, as, we, as the design is done, then we have a network of over a thousand factories all over the world. So pretty early in the design phase, we do what's called DFM, Design for Manufacturing, because you start looking at what's out there, what factories have made headphones before in this case, right? And what are recent innovations and, and other ideas we can bring together there so you don't have to design it from scratch. So basically we help the, the brand, the, the entrepreneur to go all the way from initial idea to finished product on the shelf. 
Oof. That is really cool. Um, Thank you. So it, it's like making sure that I understand it, right? It's the, it's not just the, here's how to put it all together and, you know, the, the multi-step point plan and project plan and all that, but it's actually connecting with others in, you know, throughout whichever industry that they're working in um, and connecting those dots so that they can actually take those actions on the plan as well. That's right. That's right. That's, so, you that's know, amazing. You can go to Upwork and, and hire an engineer or designer, right? But if you don't know what the best practices are to how to develop a certain product, then you're you're not also you're not going to be successful right? because you don't know how to direct their work. And particularly if you, uh, which most products we help with have some level of complexity that it either has moving parts, which then it requires mechanical engineering or it has electrical components, and then it requires electrical engineering. So now you have it at a minimum two people. You have an industrial designer and an engineer, and you have to figure out how they're going to work together and who's doing what in what order, right? So that's part of what the platform brings together. So if you don't have to be an expert in how to utilizing these resources, the platform helped you orchestrate the collaboration between everybody that has to be involved in the process of developing your product. Hmm. So when you look at... Yeah, hundred percent. So when when you're looking at, uh, we'll, we'll just say target market, and you know choosing who to get in front of and things like that, um, I think a clear winner is the the actual end user that would use the platform and, and need to create the products. Uh, but is this also a is a target market the the providers that you would be kind of pulling into the platform into that network as well the the engineers and um, things like that is that another target market or is that like a, an established network that you already had and like, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. As in any marketplace, right? There's a, there's a supply side and, and a demand side, right? In the Airbnb, it's the the guest and the host, or you know, in Uber, it's the 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 rider and the driver, and 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 in some ours is a little more complex because it's three people. It's the brand, it's the the the, the expert and the factory. But similarly, yes, you have to uh, like in any marketplace. There's a, there's a chicken and egg effect that goes in there right what comes first uh, the supply or the demand and and the truth is that you just have to build them all both at the same time right uh, the factories are not interested in being part of our net marketplace if there's not brands coming through right? and similar with the the designers they don't want to work there unless there's projects they can work on but but what makes it so powerful that when you get all those three parties working together and and magic happens and products come out then it becomes very sticky and and it's a difficult model to create. But once you create it, you have these true network effects, right? That mm -hmm. for every new party that enters into the into the marketplace, it becomes more valuable to all the other parties. And mm -hmm. that's when you can really get this kind of breakaway successes like Airbnb or Uber or uh, any any marketplace out there. So as you're have, have gone through and kind of gotten this uh, up and running and and all of that, uh, what has been kind of the approach to marketing? How how do you get in front of you know each of these three uh, primary providers or, or users of the platform? Um, what what is what have you found to work and and kind of be most successful for y'all to to get in front of that target market? Yeah, so paid search have, have worked well for us. It, it really started during the pandemic. Before that, it was more organic. Uh, we went to trade shows, and then you know when that stopped, we had to figure out how to how to still drive customers. And and fortunately for us, as you know, e-commerce was blowing up, we we got great results from paid search. There was a lot of people apparently looking for help to create new products. And then as as you know, the pandemic um, ended. It, paid search is still a really important piece of our marketing mix, but we're focusing more and more on organic. So we've created a lot of content, a lot of landing pages, a lot of case studies, things that are valuable for, for customers. And then more recently, we started doing more and more outbound. Uh, so we are now, even though we can do a lot of different products, we're focusing heavily on five categories that we're in, which are home and kitchen, sports and outdoors, baby, pet, and toys. And so within that, we're you know I'm creating lists of companies that fit our target profile. And then we're doing outbound marketing to those uh, mm -hmm. via email and, and phone calls uh, to identify folks that we, we can see. It's like, okay, you're making these kind of products. Do you want to know what products we think are going to be best, best sellers next year? If so, let's talk and... Uh, that's becoming a bigger, bigger part of our, of our mix. 
I love that. And I got to just say thank you for sharing that piece of it. I think sometimes it's often overlooked that part of marketing is creating a list and actually doing some outreach and you know, starting conversations. Um, yeah. So I, I, I appreciate you, you bringing that up here. Um, so as you look forward, you know, forward towards the next, say, three to five years, um, what are you excited about? What does this business look like? Um, you know, how does your role change as, as the business continues to grow and develop over the next three to five years? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so we, you know, the reason we got into this is that we we really believe that Gemba could be a category defining company, right? A company that creates something that didn't exist before, the Alibaba for new products, if you will. And you know, Alibaba is a two hundred billion dollar company. So could we be a two billion dollar company, ten billion dollar company? Maybe it's possible. I think the market is certainly big enough, and as far as we can tell, we're the first movers. So, so that's that's the bigger dream. You recognize that the, the odds of that are probably, um, you know, relatively low. That there's not that many true breakthrough companies like that that happen. But that's certainly our aim. That's our vision. That's what we want to do because we feel we can, like Steve Jobs said, make a dent in the world. We think that there's a lot of people out there with great ideas, um, but today they don't know how to bring them to to market. Right. Uh, we believe that human beings are by nature creators, right? We have this ability to envision things that don't exist and bring them into existence. We're, we're the only species that can do that. So I think that there's some 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 human you know, core themes here that could make Gamba a truly great company and, and a big company and a company that has a lot of impact on a lot of people. Um, and if that doesn't, you know, if it doesn't get that big, that's fine too. You know, we, we, we've we worked with a thousand customers to date. And if we continue to build a moderately successful company that helps thousands of entrepreneurs and creators to, to make their products, I think that, that that's okay too. But we're definitely aiming for the stars and, you know, swinging for the fences. <laughs> I love it. I had a, a mentor once, uh, I think he puts on an event actually. It's like you, you aim to be a billion dollar company and worst case scenario, you'd end up at a hundred million. It's like, all right. And you'd still end up with a pretty, yeah. pretty good company then. Right. That would make everybody pretty happy. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I know we've covered a you know tremendous amount in the, the conversation today and um, you know, I could totally sit here and really just dive into it for another hour, but I gotta be respectful of, of time. I want to pull us over to a few rapid fire questions, kind of pull out some, some wisdom nuggets for the audience here. Um, so a couple of them, the first one being when you look at kind of your journey, not necessarily just with Gemba, but you know, everything that you went through before that and, and, uh, previous startups and all of that, um, what would you say for you is kind of your key to success? I mean, uh, a strategy for success or how I define success. I would say if there, if you look at kind of, whether it's a, a trait or, um, a habit that you have or something that, that you can attribute back to, like I do these things yeah. and, and because of that, I tend to be successful. Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. I don't know if I have a great answer, but it, but it goes back to, I think what we talked about before It's like, you can't, it's hard to do anything meaningful alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, they say, you, you know, if you want to travel fast, travel alone. If you want to travel far, travel together. So I do think that that, you know, finding, finding good partners, uh, good team members that you enjoy working with because you're going to spend a lot of time together mm -hmm. and creating an environment that you actually, you're not dreading going to work, right? You wake up and, you know, it's, you're always going to love being with your family or, you know, going skiing more than <laughs> working, but, it, but you also find enjoyment. Uh, one of our core values is embrace the fun. And that was a core value in my prior company, Boundless too. And uh, I think that's so important that you, you try to bring the joy to every meeting. You try to get you know somebody else to smile. It can't be all serious in business all the time because life's just too short for that. Um, I love that so much. Um, how about advice? If you could give just one piece of advice to other entrepreneurs out there, um, what piece of advice would you want to leave them with today? Yeah, um, I think value. Lead with value. It's sometimes, sometimes easy to, to lose track of that ultimately your success and your what customers are willing to pay for what you do is tied to the value that is delivered, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, we tend to go after some things like, oh, this looks like a great thing and I, we can do this and think, but ultimately, is it really creating value for, 
for the person that's receiving it. If not, if it's just doing the same thing as anybody else could do, or if it's you know just doing something because of novel technology that you know people don't care about that. It's like what what are you doing for your customer? How are you changing their lives to be better? I think that's mm -hmm. that. Sometimes that, that's yeah. That would be my advice. Don't lose track of that. <laughs> that's a really good piece of advice. Uh, what about book recommendations? Anything that you're reading currently or read recently that you would you'd recommend? Uh, it can be an audiobook uh, if you're not a big reader and podcasts are your thing. Whatever you'd recommend uh, from a learning content or consumption side of things. Well, I love Good to Great. That's probably my favorite book. But right now, I'm reading this guy. The Discipline of Market Leaders, uh, a fellow CEO recommended it. Um, it's not necessarily a startup book. It's more for, for a company that's been around for a little bit. But And it really, the, the, the discipline they're talking about is, is that you have to figure out what are you? Are you a product-centric company, a customer-centric company, an operation-driven company? And and a lot of companies say, yeah, we, we're, we're good at all of that. And the book argues that you sure but you can't you can only win and dominate in one discipline and you have to decide mm. what kind of company you are mm. and it can be hard i mean and it, 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 we actually went through this at gemba too to really look at everything we do and how we stack rank against the competition you know cost benefit wise to really be brutally honest with yourself it's like can we win here is this should we be doing this <laughs> Or should we just stop, right? And that's in good to great to have this concept too of performing autopsies, autopsies without blame. So that as as a company, I think you have to create a culture where you're allowed to question everything. You're 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 constantly starting like you know Jeff Bezos says, it's, every day is day one. <laughs> you have to always challenge yourself. It's like, are we doing the right things, or should we do doing things differently? And I think that that book, Discipline of Market Leaders. Is provides a good framework for doing that. I love it. And I get to add a new one to my reading list because that one has not come up yet. That is awesome. I love it when I get a, yeah. another new one right. on here. Um, so one more rapid fire question before we kind of get into our, our final wrap up here. And this one's just kind of fun. Um, if you could you know, choose one area in your business, and that's the key, you only get to choose one spot uh, and take a little bit of magic dust and sprinkle it all over that one spot and wake up tomorrow, it's magically 10 times better than it is today. Where would you choose to put that magic dust? Oh, good question. Um, well, we, I think we what we're doing. So we, we talked about sort of the, the our business when people come to us with the product idea. What we've done lately is that we started going to the data. So we sift through all this e-commerce data to look what consumers like and don't like about existing products. So we turn that into a set of insights, and then we design products to meet those needs, basically. So we may learn that you know people they want to. Uh, an insulated drinking cup with a temperature gauge so they can see how hot the fluid is, for example. Then so you go make that product. And that's something we started to do and we've actually launched the world's first future product catalog and we're proud of it, but it's still, we're still not quite there. Um, and that's, if I, I got some fairy dust and I could you know, fast forward two years and get to where we want to be, then we could basically... You know, you, it, you'd make it as easy to create a new product as it is to buy an existing product today with it, with the benefit too, that you can, you want to see the ratings and reviews in advance of actually creating the products that people, they love, they want this. There are people out there searching for this product and it doesn't exist. So that's, yeah, that's where I put my fair dust. <laughs> I, that might be one of the best answers I've I've ever gotten. Um, that is oh, so thank cool. You. Um, all right. So for those that are watching that you know, want to you know continue to follow, want to learn more about you, want to learn more about the business, um, kind of want to check into it a bit a bit more. Where can we advise them to go for more information? Yeah, please go to gemba.com. G E M B A H dot com. Uh, or email me at henrik at gemba.com. That's H-E-N-R-I-K at gemba.com. Um, if you have an idea or if you had, just want to start a new company or have you ever thought about doing it, uh, Gemba is a great place to start. And whether you end up working with us or not, I hope you find some inspiration on the site and learn some case studies and see that you actually can do it. It's possible. Um it's not free and it's not easy, but we make it a lot easier and cheaper than it has been in the past. 
I love that. For those that are watching, I'll put all of that in the video description below. So please make sure you take a moment, go click the links, go check it all out. Um, send Henrik an email. I'll probably put your LinkedIn in there as well. At minimum, just send a message that, hey, saw you on the business spotlight. Great conversation. Uh, it's always good to just kind of connect to their entrepreneurs and business owners, especially here in Central Texas. So please take a moment to do that here. Uh, but Henrik, as we finish up, I have one question I always like to end these things on. And that is simply, what is most inspiring to you today? Good one. Um, I'd say it's it's all our customers, uh, people like you. I mean, all these people out there uh, pursuing an entrepreneurial career of creating something, whether it's you know the best cinnamon bun or you know the best coaching business or you're a real estate agent or or you're starting a tech company. I think. Uh, entrepreneurs are are the heroes of our generation you know, we create jobs we uh um uh, we make things better um and move move the world forward uh, i think that i think that and it's hard anybody who's done this right it's not easy there's a lot of 3 a.m nights you wake up and wondering what the heck you're doing uh so that's that's what i'd say inspiring that there's so many people out there that are willing to put the work in and be in the arena and do the best they can to create a better future for themselves and others. So I find that inspiring. It's amazing. Henrik, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been a genuine pleasure. Um, like I mentioned before, I could probably sit here and chat with you for another two hours <laughs> and just like dive into some fun stuff. But I, I want to say thank you for, for allocating a bit of time and, and sharing with us today. Well, thank you, Tanner. It's been a pleasure and uh, look forward to staying in touch.